Okay, so uh, because this evening was meant to be Callum and Psalm 125, and it was just this morning that we, we had to change things, uh, I, I've, I didn't prepare anything new. I didn't have time, uh, probably just as well. Uh, but uh, so to, just to put it in the picture, I'm going to preach from what I preached at the opening sermon of the General Assembly this week. Uh, as a retiring moderator, you have to open the, the proceedings with a sermon. So I'm sorry, you're getting that, okay? Uh, I've slightly adapted it and changed it, uh, hopefully. Um, if you were there on Monday night, I'm scanning around, there maybe wasn't many. You may, of course, watch it on the internet if you were a really sad kind of individual and didn't have anything else in, in your life to do. Uh, but if you did, then you have my permission to sleep. If uh, you didn't and you sleep, then I'll just call you out, okay? So uh, you can, you can, you know, you can test me on that one. But uh, so uh, it was related to the, the leaders of the church, obviously, the ministers and elders, but it's equally relevant in many ways and can be relevant to, uh, very much so, to uh, everyone in the church, maybe with specific reference uh, to leaders as it was, but uh, I, I try to broaden it out as much as I can. It's just the last few verses of that chapter, chapter 9, <clears throat> where, when verse 38, when Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like a sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly for the Lord, to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. So, you know, there's that ongoing thing about Christian lives and being in the church and the toughness sometimes of belonging to a community, uh, the toughness of being part of a church. Uh, church life is really tough. Uh, but also just the reality of being Christians uh, in our lives. Uh, we can, uh, uh, as leaders and as church people, uh, as Christians, we ourselves can be confused uh, and discouraged and disappointed by what's happening uh, spiritually, maybe sometimes focusing that on God, but often on other people. But we know that we can discourage and confuse and disappoint other people. We know the institution of the church has a great history of discouraging and uh, disappointing people. Uh, and yet, we seek constantly as a community of worshipers, as a family together, as people who love Jesus Christ and who love worshiping Jesus Christ together, uh, we want to recognize and remind ourselves of the importance of um, our responsibility towards one another and our responsibility to encourage one another uh, in community against the rampant individualism of the day and the generation in which we live, where we're tempted to say, well, we don't need the church. I don't need anyone else. I'll just live my own Christian life quietly and peacefully uh, without considering anyone else. Um, but we recognize that if we're following Jesus, we need to seek His example and follow uh, the kind of calling and um, the uh, attitude of mind that he had himself uh, as he lived among people. So, we're all living among people, and so we learn, I think, from Jesus' example, and we hope to do that. But just as an aside, before going into this little passage, I think just to remind, as I reminded the wider church, I remind uh, myself and yourselves of two uh, things very briefly all the time. Uh, there was a this is another. This is an aside from the aside. There was a um, Malawian preacher at the assembly, and he did that great African welcome. He said, "God is good." The congregation say all the time, and then he says all the time, and the congregation say, "God is good." So, I'm taking. I'm talking about all the time again. Okay, that's just a second aside. All the time, God is good, but all the time, in the same way, we need God's protection, don't we? Uh, in our Christian lives, we need God's protection. You know, you come this evening, and we all come, and we recognize our need as Christians of God's protection. It's important to be spiritually sharp and alert, dependent, prayerful, and vigilant. So, it's always important for us to be listening to the great shepherd of our sheep. This is a passage where Jesus reveals what he's like as a shepherd, 
And uh, it's important always to be listening to the great shepherd of a sheep and coming under his protection as the great shepherd who wants us to be under his, his wing, as it were, and uh, who wants us to take the toughness of our Christian lives and come to him for protection from the destroyer. Because there's always a destroyer of our souls, and he comes in many guises. Do we know that, don't we? So we need his protection. That's an aside. But we also, uh, as a second aside, we need to keep our focus. And going back to the Gospels is good for that, you know. It's good to keep our focus and all not feel bad about being stripped back to gospel basics. And I was focusing that for, I guess, our leaders, but much for ourselves as well. It's easy to focus on the church as an institution, uh, as an end in itself, that, you know, you come together and you lead the church and blah, blah, blah. But we can absolutely lose priority and we can lose the f- significance of where we're going. And it's very easy to do that as Christians as well in our own lives, uh, you know, so it's good for us to be stripped back to Jesus and to gospel basics and to ask ourselves, you know, what is it that takes up our energy and our, our time spiritually while the world and our friends, as Dave was saying, perish? And as we get older, what is it that is important to us? What, what is it that we get excited about? What's precious to us? What do we get worked up about in the church, maybe? Uh, some ridiculous things, but just generally in our lives, it's easy to get Uh, sidetracked by silly issues, by secondary matters, by hobby horses, or or matters that are really insignificant in in terms of the kingdom and and the kingdom value. So, it's important to be protected, and it's important to keep our focus. And in that light, I want to come back to what Jesus is saying here and focus on two positive things that we can take, I hope we can take away from this evening for our own uh, lives. Uh, Because this is Jesus among people, okay? Now, you'll all be among people. We'll all be among people in the days that lie ahead. Um, And my prayer for us, uh, for all of us, is that we uh, mimic the attitude and the uh, uh, invitation or the command of Jesus that he gives us in this passage. So, So, there's two things I'm going to speak about briefly. First is compassion, and the second is calling, okay? And we can relate to all of these things as we think of the great shepherd of our sheep. So, Jesus Christ, when he saw all the crowds, he had compassion on them, for they were harassed and helpless like a sheep without a shepherd. Jesus saw the people that he was around, Jesus the Son of God, Jesus the perfect Son, and he was moved deep down into his guts. That's what it says. That's what the word compassion means in the original. It, He was so moved by what he saw. And you know that feeling, don't you, when you're so moved by something that it either provokes you to tears or it provokes your guts to turn. Uh, It gives you butterflies in your stomach because there's that unmistakable link between body and soul in our lives. And, And anything that affects us powerfully in our hearts, in our being, affects us physically as well. And Jesus' spiritual concern for the people had this physical effect and that his compassion for them was gut-wrenching, is really how we could paraphrase that, gut-wrenching compassion for the people around him. He looked around and he saw them spiritually and thought, these guys have no spiritual leadership. They've got no one looking after them. They've got no one to follow. Their their spiritual leaders uh, have abandoned them and have neglected them. And that's what he's… it's almost like he's revisiting uh, God's complaint uh, in Ezekiel's day uh, to the people, the uh, leaders of Ezekiel's day. It's a really powerful uh, section, Ezekiel 34. You have not strengthened the weak. You've not healed the sick, bandaged the injured, brought back the strays or sought the lost, but with force and harshness you have ruled over them. They were scattered because they had no shepherd, and they became food for every wild beast. My sheep scattered, wandered over all the mountains and on every high hill. My sheep were scattered over the entire face of the earth because no one was looking or searching for them. That's the picture that Jesus is reminding himself as he looks around at these uh, uh, people that he was seeing, that there was no compassion for them, that, that religious leaders were harsh and authoritarian. And uh, he saw and recognized that the people… Uh, around him spiritually were 
they were weak, and they were straying, and they were lost souls. That's what Jesus sees. And it's important, I think, when we think of other Christians, and we think of the Christian church, and maybe even when we think of the leadership as well, um, and I do wonder about this sometimes, about the whole makeup of church and what it's like, that we t- what we tend to think and what we tend to do when, when we come together in church is everything seems to be together. Everything seems to be, um, the, the, or that everyone else seems to have things together when we come to church. And uh, when we see everyone, we see people who are pristine c- Christians, who are doing great as Christians. And you maybe come into that situation and you're afraid of their judgment. You're afraid that they will look at you and think, well, you haven't got your life together, and you don't seem to be doing so well. And you sense a lack of interest in your struggles and your battles because you feel that everyone else has their life together. It's a great challenge to us that we don't look at people that way, but we look at people the way Jesus looked at them. Uh, And so I would challenge us all to see the vitality of compassion in our Christian lives. I, you know, if, if I was asked the question, what is it that any church or St. Columbus or, or any Christian, what is one of the most important character? I know it's difficult to, to uh, list uh, grade characteristics. It's kind of a false division in a sense. But I, I would be hard-pressed to go beyond compassion as a, a, a tremendous, a, a Christ-centered compassion for people. You, there's, there's, you know, a, a solid, powerful picture in the Old Testament of the compassion of God for His people in Ezekiel 16. You know, I've, I've often used it here. You know it because it's one of my favorites. Of the, a newborn baby. We were praying for the unborn child today, this morning. But, uh, and there's a great picture in Ezekiel 16 of a, a newborn baby just thrown out into the desert, not even washed, covered in blood, bloody newborn baby left to die. And God sees that. A newborn baby girl, and he picks her up, and he washes her, and he clothes her, and he feeds her, and he looks after her, and uh, she grows up in his home, and then he clothes her like a queen, and uh, he marries her, and she becomes his bride. And there's an incredible, compassionate picture of uh, this is how God sees his people. And of course, in the New Testament, you have uh, Corey's favorite picture of the prodigal son, the prodigal father, more than the prodigal son. Great pictures of compassion. And why is it, why is it such a good characteristic for us? Because it's because it reveals that we understand, as we come together, it understand, we understand our own hearts. Uh, and therefore, we understand the hearts of others. We understand how compassionate the great shepherd of the sheep has been for us. And we, we know what it's like to be helpless and harassed and dejected and deserted. And so we, having received that, live that. We live that with others. We, we lead and we live with compassion. And all that we do as a people, as a church, and we seek to show the same love and patience that's been shown to us, to others, kind, generous, understanding, empathetic. That's the kind of discipleship we're looking for in St. Columbus. We're not machines. We're not Christian machines. We're not Christian terminators. We are people, we're not servant fodder to keep the institution of the church and its programs going. Our job, our work as as leaders in the church is to support, is to love, to equip, to train, and show compassion to uh, each other. I think that, you know, if if I was to go tomorrow, I think if we if St. Columbus had that as a hallmark, I'd be pretty happy. It was known as a compassionate church, not organized compassion, not uh, uh, institutionalized compassion, but the, it stemmed naturally from our understanding of the gospel that the preaching you'd heard week to week drove you to Jesus and drove you to your knees to that place where you have that compassion for others. Uh, and not in a dramatic way, but just in an ordinary way, the people sitting next to you, the people that maybe are isolated or whatever it might be. You see, because we're in the people business. We're in the people business because we're about God's business. 
So, you know, the church doesn't exist, uh, the people don't exist to keep the church. It's not about structures and position and power and uniformity and procedures and legislation, all these things that I rattled off at the assembly, <clears throat> however important they might be. We are not primarily heresy hunters, uh, moralists, hermits, or dictators. Sorry, I'm going into assembly mode here. <clears throat> uh, but we can all get sidetracked, can't we, into these things. We can get sidetracked into things that are not about people, and people can be a kind of added, frustrating extra that just cause difficulty for us. But as we understand Jesus Christ and what He's done for us and this great love for a world that rejects Him, then it helps us as He has loved us so much to reach down and save us then we can show compassion to the world in which we live. And, and as under-shepherds, as leaders, we need to be compassionate. To, and you need to pray for the elders and deacons and leaders in the church here to uh, be compassionate, uh, because compassion is hugely significant for us. If we don't have it, we've lost our connection with Jesus. And for all of us, we need the compassion that is strong enough to push us out of our comfort zones to the edges of our experience to save the lost. Jesus speaks about that, doesn't he, in this passage that, you know, they were harassed and helpless, in Ezekiel rather, reaching out for the lost. You need to be willing, you need to be willing, and I need to be willing to go to the cliff edges for the lost, the people that you know, the people that you know are on the edge of a lost eternity, and, and you have that opportunity to, to be compassionate to have that prayerful concern and loving and long and urgency for them. It's good to be moved to you, the, the very, your, I guess, even moved right into our guts uh, for the condition of people and for their spiritual lostness. And as we know grace, it enables us to be compassionate. I, I, I just can't, I can't, um, I can't dovetail the idea of someone who knows a lot about Jesus, but who is not compassionate. I just, I just don't get it. I know we all fail and fall, and I know I drastically fall short, but there's, there has to be the two coming together, doesn't it, as we understand ourselves. So, compassion. The second thing, briefly, is calling. Jesus moves on to say to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. So, he's changing his metaphor, and he's moving from sheep. He's moving from uh, uh, the, sh the shepherd's uh, field to the grain field, as it were. And this is not the parable of the sower. This is the parable of the, or, or the illustration, anyway, of the harvest um, I think sometimes we like the parable of the sower um, more than the challenge of the harvest, because we like the thought of being able to sow or being able to uh, maybe share the Word, um, and we can leave uh, the harvest maybe to others because we are not seeing the harvest, maybe. Maybe that's why. But I think what's clear in God's Word and what's clear here and elsewhere, maybe particularly in John chapter 4, he talks about sowers, uh, 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 sowing and reaping uh, together. So, that the, the sowing and the reaping both rely on God's sovereignty, and we're in called, as Jesus says in John 4, to be engaged in both, both sowing and harvesting. And the great thing, what he reminds us here is the harvest… Uh, He's the Lord of the harvest. It's His, it's his harvest. It's a really comforting. We, what a great relief. You know, we, we don't need to worry about the harvest. We don't need to worry about how many souls under our watch come to faith, because that's His work. He gives us… The, the harvest is plentiful. In other words, the, the opportunity is there. Uh, the people are there. The need is there. We are to be out among them. He will give the harvest, and we rejoice in that. And in this life, in this life which is both battles and blessings, which we know, it's also at times there's weeping and there's rejoicing. There's times when it's a struggle and there's times when it's a blessing. But there's a time when not only should we be uh, plowing 
uh, the hard ground spiritually, but we should be harvesting and seeing souls saved. We should be seeing people come into faith. And he says, that is exactly what I'm promising you. We were speaking about God's promises this morning uh, and the faith to believe in them like Abraham. Uh, and our expectation should be both because we have bad news, but maybe we dwell so much in the bad news we forget the good news. We forget that uh, Jesus has come to save people and uh, that there is a harvest. And maybe we need, maybe particularly in our own context, to change our expectation levels to make them greater. And not just to analyze the missionary world that we see and say, well, God's working in the East, and God's working in the Southern Hemisphere, and He's working in uh, South America, and many thousands are coming to faith. He's moved on from the West. But that, that's, that's God's business. But let us still have an expectation and pray for the harvest. Sowing and reaping rely on God's sovereignty, and we, we call out to Him in His sovereignty to fulfill His promise. But we call out in prayer because prayer and work is our work. We do both together. We, there's, there's simply no getting away in God's calling to us, not only to be compassionate, but to be workers. The harvest is plenty, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest. So, you know, there's no getting away from our our significant dependence on God as a church, as Christians. Now, I know, I hope none of you have any problems with strategy or planning or vision casting or professionalism and expertise. These are all great things, but they're all to be done in the shadow of the Almighty. They're all to be done in dependence on Him. We hold loosely to these things. We don't depend on them, but they're not alternative wisdom, but we do all these things in expectation of God to work. But work we must. Work you must as a Christian because it's a great honor. It's a great privilege. Grace doesn't make us lazy. Compassion doesn't make us lazy Christians. It makes us willing to sacrifice and serve and follow and honor because it's a joy, because we're only here for a few years. I know the young guys here don't think that. I know you think you'll live forever, and that's great, and it's tremendous to be young. But it was only yesterday I was your age, just yesterday, just 24 hours ago. And now look how old and decrepit I am. And yet we don't have, we have such a short time here, and time isn't guaranteed. And he wants us to work in his kingdom and work for his kingdom. There's a very famous quote. Well, I think it's famous. Uh, which says, nobody said on their deathbed, I wish I'd spent more time in the office. You probably heard that. Uh, that nobody wishes they spent more time in the office when it comes to end of their lives. Well, I can imagine every grace-touched believer when they meet with Jesus on that last great day as believers, I think they, what they will say is, I wish I'd spent more time serving Jesus better. Not to earn anything from Him, not in some kind of legalistic way. But he was worth, my goodness, He was worth giving my all for. He was worth me spending and being spent. He was worth my soul. He was worth my obedience. He was worth my giving body and soul so that I compassionately was moved in my guts to see the lost and to serve Him with compassion. So, prayer and work is our work, and we are called uh, to be laborers. And therefore, I close with a challenge that I've often made here, and I have to make to myself often. I think we are the answer to our prayer. You know, the prayer is given here. He says, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest field. Well, who's the answer to that prayer? As God sends out laborers, it's not angels He sends out. He doesn't send a host from heaven down that we sit back and say, oh, great, there's the laborers. We are the laborers. So it's a dangerous prayer, and sometimes it's a dangerous thing to pray. Good thing. 
but a dangerous thing, and we are the answer to this prayer. So, it's, a, it's an acknowledgement of the way God works, and we are therefore His mission workers. It's our great commission. We are purveyors of good news. That's our task, our calling. So, I'm glad to be pushing an agenda in the assembly of our church for church planting, for that great model of reaching out and planting churches and saving the lost. And it sometimes astonishes me where the people are cynical or uh, disinterested in, in that, as if it's some kind of passing phase. We're mission workers. We reach out with the gospel. We equip workers to mission. Our calling as leaders, as church ministers, is to equip the saints. What to do? To be workers. That we live out and that we share our faith. People, generally speaking, are not going to come into church to hear the gospel. They think, oh, I need to hear the gospel today. I don't feel I know very much. I think I'll go to church. Now, that might happen on the odd occasion, but it generally doesn't happen. It usually is people will be provoked to have no knowledge by your life on the front line as you courageously, boldly, humbly, and compassionately live out your life and share your faith. And people will say, well, I, I want to think about going to the place they go on a Sunday and worship because I see something in their life as frontline workers. They wouldn't, they wouldn't call it that, of course. Uh, and I'm interested in that. So, you're in the harvest. You're out there where the people are, where this great harvest is. And we are, I am, of course, called to do the same. The opportunities aren't so easy when you're in a full-time ministry, but we're all called to do that, workers. And we're workers together. It's not Therefore, pray earnestly for the Lord of the harvest to send out a combine harvester with one driver who will do all the work and plow thousands and thousands of acres of field or harvest them all. It's not that picture that we have. We have a picture, a agrarian, uh, rural uh, picture of many, many workers heading out to take in the harvest. It, it's, it's not the job of a professional is the job of all of us together. The power of community. And I do think today, probably more than ever, it is the work of community. It's the work of church together, of people together, sharing their faith, living out their faith, and inviting others into that community of people, uh, then into their community of worshiping. And in answer to our prayers, not only do we do it together, but we do it urgently. Therefore, send out laborers into his harvest. You know, you can't wait a year or two years and have set up a committee to look into whether we should have more laborers or less, what part of the field we should go into, uh, because the harvest will be rotten. You know, there's a sense in which Jesus uses this picture because there's an urgency. The harvest is ready now. It is, you know, it's not going to be in two years' time there's going to be a a revival of the Holy Spirit's work, and we'll wait until that time and get ready. It's now we're going to be living. We might not be here in two years' time. So, it's now. We can't wait. Now is the acceptable time. And so, there's that grace. And I do think probably all of us, and I absolutely include myself in this, uh, we've lost a, a sense of urgency. I don't know why that might be the case. Maybe it's modernity or science or the feeling that you know, we've got, we're in control and that we'll carry on and there's plenty of time. It's okay, there's plenty of time. Uh, we're not in a part of the world where maybe our lives are in danger every day or there's poverty or famine or floods or dangers and uh, persecution. Uh, someone was saying at the assembly actually that 80% of the world's Christians are being persecuted. Uh, we're in the absolute minority uh, being the 20% that are not, and that's an unusual situation. Um, and maybe that's partly why urgency is gone. But we can, we can ask and pray for the Holy Spirit to inculcate in us a daily urgency about our calling, about our calling to be harvesters in school, in university, in the vet practice, uh, in the home, in your neighborhood, that we have this great calling 
to fuse the two things together, don't they? Compassion and calling. We see them both. And it's our identity. It, uh, it is to shape all that we are and all that we do. And uh, I think the compassion that not only we show, but I hope the compassion that we receive uh, from our fellow Christians is, and, and from the Christian community is what helps us to carry on. Because it's tough. And we don't need to be beaten up and we don't need to be exposed to our failure. But I hope that when you rise from the Lord's day with God's people, that the compassion you've been shown and the encouragement and the, the building up helps you to go on and, and fulfill your calling. I, I did note, and I'm sure this is a cultural thing as well, but we'd, a couple of weeks ago we had two sets of American groups here. We had an American group in the morning from a, a church somewhere. I <laughs> can't remember what it was the morning. They, they came unexpectedly. And in the evening with the church from Orlando uh, that support Esk Valley. And what a lot of people said to me, particularly those in leadership from this end, Tom and, and other elders and others, what they said was how encouraging and reaffirming and uh, positive these people were. And they, they, I mean, it was cultural, but in many ways, but it was just, just kind of felt good after being in their company. You know, they weren't looking for your faults. They weren't looking for your failures. They were looking to pick out something that they could encourage you with uh, and build you up. And that's a great quality. We're not great at that in Scotland, uh, but it's a great quality. It's a great Christian quality. And it's, it's a, a quality of compassion. And may it be that we are encouragers and, and those who are compassionate towards one another, uh, recognizing our own hearts and the hearts of others, and therefore sp spirit-filled and enabled to fulfill our calling. And if you don't know Jesus, he's the great shepherd of the sheep. You should know him, and you should come to know him tonight if you don't. Let's bow our heads and pray. Lord God, help us to live for you and live in your name. Help us to uh, mimic your compassion, having received it and uh, knowing our undeserving nature. Help us to recognize that we're not called to uh, change people or breathe spiritual life into them. That is your work. It's your harvest. You are the Lord. But you do choose to use us, and we long to be used, and we ask for forgiveness when we're not interested, or we think it's someone else's job or the minister's or something. Help us to know and see that you have empowered and also privileged us to be uh, your workers. And help us be with everyone here tonight. Remember their colleagues at work, their friends, maybe their husbands or wives, their children, uh, their fellow students, fellow people in school, their neighbors who they may be praying for and uh, seeking an opportunity to witness to. Remember our own congregation, those who are struggling, those who don't want to be part of the community because they feel judged or they feel isolated or um, unworthy. Uh, why ever they should feel that, we don't know. Be with those who would love to be with us pub very physically and publicly here in church, but who can't, either in work or uh, health reasons or age. Lord, may we be compassionate and caring and interested and willing to serve and help us to fulfill our calling, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.